run deep You need a compass to guide you, a promise to keep With a patchy arrow in hand, we're flying high Processing queries under a wide open sky Welcome to the lake house, where the rivers flow Federated queries make your data glow from iceberg to reflections, we're breaking the mold In the Trevio Lake House, your stories unfold A patchy iceberg keeps your data strong Hey everybody, and welcome to this presentation on modern data infrastructure for customers. So the idea here is we're talking about the challenges that customers already feel with legacy architecture and the benefits that they can have when they move to sort of modern uh, architecture, which could be referred to as a modern data lake or a modern data lake house. But before we get started, let's introduce uh, what we'll be covering today and where we'll be going from there. So we're going to be talking about what are those challenges that customers face when dealing with their current infrastructure, evaluating the options to, well, improve upon that, you know, get all sorts of benefits like reduction in costs, be able to build a better foundation for AI and ML projects, have the flexibility to deploy where they need to, whether it's on the cloud or on-prem, and have a solution that's going to scale as their workflows grow and their data sizes grow uh, without the kind of frictions that existed in the past. After we cover all that, we'll do a question and answer. And basically, bringing you through this journey today is uh, myself and Brenna Book from Minayo. Um, I'll give a minute for uh, Brenna to introduce herself. Great. Um... Uh, thank you for the intro. I've been a data engineer for about 10 years, and now I'm the senior technical evangelist at MinIO around databases and data lakes. Super happy to be here. And hey, everybody, uh, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a senior tech evangelist at uh, Dremio. I've been at Dremio for about two and a half years, have worked in the web and data spaces. Uh, recently was a co-author on Apache Iceberg, the Definitive Guide, a new book from O'Reilly on the topic of Iceberg, which will be a big part of today's presentation. And uh, yeah, now that you know who we are, let's let's get on with the conversation. And for that, I want to bring uh, Brenna back on to talk to us about the challenges that customers are facing in modern times. So uh, we have a lot of customers and through both supporting their implementation and extensive interviewing, uh, we've uncovered three main challenges that they all face across the board. Dealing with aging legacy architectures, building and growing their AI ML infrastructure and the optionality that comes from being able to deploy anywhere. So breaking it down, uh, legacy infrastructures, they're expensive to maintain. They don't deliver the performance required by really modern uh, workloads. And um, frankly, they were built before the cloud. So they don't have things like RESTful API support. They don't uh, do things like containerization and orchestration really anything that's part of the modern cloud operating model. It's just not supported by these architectures. So the next thing everyone is putting in place right now is a scalable foundation for AI and ML. It's the watchword of the day, the thing that we're all building towards. 
And the reality is that nobody has less data than the day before. Data is always growing and AI and ML initiatives just gobble up uh, immense amounts of data. And the retrieval of data, AI modeling, feature selection, all of these things need to be lightning quick. Otherwise, these initiatives will fail. There's just nothing else for it. And so we, we want to make decisions about architecture that enable this very necessary growth and performance as opposed to creating obstacles to it. And part of that is avoiding retrofitting legacy architectures, particularly those that have, you know, like a POSIX interface. Um, you really want an S3 RESTful API if you're building for the future. I want to be able to support those things, your advanced analytics, AI ML workloads, vector searches, all that good stuff uh, that are here now from an AI perspective. Um, but since this uh, market area is always growing, you really want to build the future. You want to support those models and services and platforms that are coming down the lines. You want to select technologies that work the ecosystem that's here today, all those um, services that are on the market right now and are great and fantastic, but more importantly, you want to select technologies for your architecture as you build it that are prepared to grow with you over time. And finally, a lot of our customers right now are looking for as much flexibility and optionality as they can. Sometimes there's regulatory mandates around supporting multi-cloud and hybrid cloud design structures. Sometimes it's just the desire to have the ability to move around workloads as needed, whether that's the public clouds, private clouds, colos, data centers. And the idea here is that this optionality also provides you um, with the ability to go anywhere with your data. So anywhere you need to. Um, and this allows you to actually address costs heads on because optionality allows you to seek the platform on which it's optimal to run your specific workload. And everybody's workloads are going to have different characteristics and different requirements. And that are the things that should determine where the best place to run those workloads are not uh, vendor contracts or um, you know your specific hardware um, you should be able to design your infrastructure based on the workloads that you're trying to run on it and so those are the challenges that we see when we talk to our customers and i'll hand it back to alex to talk about how i'm and i on dremio together um, can address some of these challenges. Thank you, Brenna. Uh, that's right. We'll be talking about how we can solve these challenges, how we can move off that legacy architecture, build that better foundation for AI ML, while giving that flexibility to deploy where you want, when you need to, uh, and have that sort of optionality. Um, but bottom line is that whenever you're trying to discover a solution, you should always start backwards going in, figure out, hey, what it is that you, what is the experience that you need? What is the end result that you want? and then work from there. And that's where we start with our hard requirements, starting, hey, what are the end results? Now, this may not necessarily be the end results that every customer wants, but this, these are some of the requirements we see a lot of customers have. Looking to build a data platform that is AI ready, basically able to deliver data performantly for AI model, you know, for preparing data, for training models, for deploying models, that is performant in that regard. Okay, being able to query data really fast, being able to retrieve data from storage really fast, basically offering the ability to kind of move quickly, especially when you think about the time it takes to train a lot of these AI models, every little bit of performance really goes a long way. It's scalable, okay? As you have more data, you wanna be able to store it. As you have bigger data, you wanna be able to query those big, big, sometimes petabyte size data sets. You want to have flexibility. You want to be able to work with different types of data located in different places. So you want to be able to kind of store any kind of data, whether it's structured or unstructured. You want to be able to query data wherever it is in whatever format it is. Um, you want to have something that's cloud native that is built to also work in the cloud, not just on-prem. And then also something that is secure that gives you levers for security at different layers. And, you know, when you meet all these hard requirements, what you end up having is a, a data platform that looks a lot like this. 
Okay, so essentially what happens is you have all the data that's being generated by your organization, whether it's from databases that power operational systems or logs that are being generated by those systems, data that's coming in from the web, from other devices like IoT devices. Generally, you're going to land all that data and store it somewhere, and that's your data lake, and that'll be powered by MinIO. Now, part of that data is unstructured. So this is like, you know, text files, audio, video that just land as those types of files. But then you're also going to have structured data. Okay. And then traditionally what you would do is you would land that data in the data lake and then have to then move it into some sort of data warehouse that would allow you to have the benefits of basically tables, like tables in a database, which we'll talk more about in a moment. But in modern times, you have now data lake table formats that allow you to take that structured data and create those data warehouse like tables directly on your data lake storage. Iceberg is one of those formats that has lots of really cool, unique benefits. And then when you pair that with Dremio, a lake house platform that provides you several layers of benefit in the sense of being one, being able to query the data on your data lake very performantly. So Dremio has first class support for Apache Iceberg tables, but can also query your CSV files, your JSON files, your Parquet files, can also query data you might have in other places like databases and data warehouses, allowing you to kind of query all that data in one place and really get maximum use of that data lake. But Dremio also goes a step further in providing you management features for those Iceberg tables, whether it's automatically uh, managing those tables, optimizing those tables, doing table cleanup to make sure that um, you're only storing the data that you need, also providing uh, a catalog, a integrated catalog with sort of Git-like features that allows you to isolate ingestion work, allows you to create zero copy experimental uh, environments to, to develop and work on your data uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of value you get when you have that Dremio Lakehouse platform that also acts as sort of a uniform interface for your users where they can kind of see a window pane to all of their data in one place. And on top of that, you get the performance at each layer where MinIO is designed to give you high performance on data storage and data retrieval. And you've got Dremio that's going to give you high performance on querying that data and delivering that data to things like data like uh, Python notebooks, BI dashboards, data applications that you're building on top of your data world when you have a next gen data lake house uh, infrastructure like this. But what is a data lake house? Okay, well, data lake house is a combination of things like data warehouses and data lakes that had lots of different uh, pros and cons. I mean, you had data warehouses that were really built for structured data. They allow you to have data tables and tables allow you to have certain guarantees and certain benefits like schema evolution, like time travel, and, and sometimes being able to version, maybe version that data, but not necessarily usually in data warehouses. But on top of that, um, but there's a catch to that, okay? Data warehouses are nice because they have these nice tables that have these asset guarantees, schema evolution, all that stuff, but then you'd have to ETL that data. So that means you'd have to take the data you've already landed on your data lake and then have to move it one more time into a data warehouse with all the compute costs, storage costs, egress fees that come along with that. And also just the extra time that it takes to do that. On top of it, oftentimes, especially when you're thinking about like on-prem solutions, oftentimes you run into an issue where there's only vertical scalability, okay? Because basically you want to have a bigger, you need more scale. Usually you can scale in two ways, vertical and horizontal. Vertical just means you get a bigger box. So you have a more powerful computer with more memory and more storage and more uh, hard drive space in order to handle the, the more work versus horizontal scaling where you, instead of saying, hey, we're going to use a bigger computer, we're going to say we're going to have multiple computers do the work and you split up the work across multiple computers. Because of the nature of data warehouses, oftentimes these solutions were limited to vertical scalability. So you need to get a bigger and bigger box. And there comes a time where you can only get such a big box. So you had you had these sort of scalability um, tensions that would exist. Again, particularly in non-prem environments. Now, data lakes, on the other hand, they're mainly focusing on storing your data, okay? And which means all data, okay? So unstructured data gets first class support here because you can store those MP3 files, those audio files, those video files, those text files that can contain the text of your emails and PDFs that contain documents. All that stuff can be easily stored on that storage layer. You could also store structured data, but it doesn't realize it's structured data. It's just other files like Parquet files which is fine because again a data lake is meant to store data and, and of different types so that way you can access it but it's not 
a data warehouse. It doesn't have tables. It is so which would have the schema evolution, uh, the 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 um, time travel, and these other features that you would expect from being able to have like data warehouse like tables. But you do get the benefit of horizontal scalability. So oftentimes you would have both of these systems, okay? Data lakes were much more affordable to store large amounts of data in, and they were great because you could store structured and unstructured data. Um, but again, you didn't have the same kind of guarantees when it comes to working with analytical data. So you'd have to move a part of that data to the data warehouse. Well, with something like Iceberg, that Iceberg metadata, that because that's what Iceberg is, it's a standard for how you write metadata around your data files, allows tools to interact with those tables in the same way they would interact with a data warehouse table, giving you the same guarantees and now unlocking those features like schema evolution, time travel, and even new features like data versioning and things like that, all while retaining the benefits of being able to horizontally scale, uh, being able to have that lower price point and storing that data and only having one copy of the data so you don't have to do the ETL work that you would have to do with a data warehouse. You get all of that in sort of one solution. And that's why it's called a data lake house because you get the best of the data lake in a data warehouse. So with that, what are the pieces that create this data lake house, this modern data lake? Well. I want to bring Brandon back to tell us about the sort of three main categories of components that make a data lake house. Great. Uh, so the three main categories or layers in a data lake house are storage, open table formats within the storage, and the compute layer, which operates on that data within the storage layer. So uh, to break it down, storage really needs to be high performance. These queries need to be fast, especially when we talk about AI and ML workloads, we're talking about fast amounts of data that need to be retrieved very quickly. And um, the object storage is the a usual uh, suspect in the storage layer, right? It's the only kind of storage really that can handle both unstructured and structured data. Uh, that is the foundation or the definition of the data lake, as, as Alex pointed out. These uh, open table formats, and Alex is a big fan of Iceberg, as am I, of course, um, but there's also um, um, Hootie and Delta Lake, which are the other two open table formats that can reside within uh, object storage. And these this is where like you get really cool stuff like schema evolution and time travel, um, things that make the modern data lake really a differentiator between um, the old um, database models. And then finally, the compute layer, which operates on the object storage. So the so in this model, the data doesn't migrate out of object storage, which is also another key differentiator. The compute sits on top of the uh, storage layer and queries the data inside it. So um, storage and compute are disaggregated, completely separated, um, and you're not loading data into your database as you would in uh, um, a traditional architecture where the storage and compute are tightly coupled. So this is a really cool um, uh, look, a uh, thousand view look at, at, at what, a, what these three components that make up the modern data lake. But let's dig in a little deeper, Alex, if you could go to the next slide. We'll talk about um, object storage. So MinIO is one of those object storage uh, software solutions that allows you to treat uh, object storage as primary storage for modern data lakes. And it has this ability because um, uh, of the performance um, from the scale, scalability perspective, from the simplicity's perspective, and, and from the security perspective, without these feature sets, it just wouldn't be possible um, to have object storage be primary storage for for modern data lakes. Um, so let's break it down a little bit more. We talk about uh, performance. I mean, I is the fastest object storage software on the market. It's faster than S3 even deployed into AWS um, benchmark of a 32 node um, MinIO cluster on NVMe, which is just commercial hardware stuff you can get off the shelves, um, clocked puts at 165 gigabytes per second and gets 325 gigabytes per second, which is super fast. Um, 
And the reason why MinIO is able to accomplish this type of speed is because MinIO takes complete advantage of the available hardware. It, it, it fills the wire. Um, the performance is only constrained by the underlying hardware available to it, meaning your MinIO performance will only be dictated by the hardware you run it on. Um, you run it on uh, slow disk, you're going to have slow retrieval, right? That's naturally a connection that um, is, is, easy, is easy to make. And this, this speed is not a, just a vanity metric. The developers and architects of MinIO aren't just obsessed with speed. Performance is a requirement for modern workloads. And I know I said this before, but nobody likes low queries. They, they just kill every initiative. They make everything look vintage. Um, speed is a requirement for modern workloads. And it's a requirement to treat object storage as primary storage. And this is opposed to secondary storage like backups and restore, which is traditional warehouse of, of storage. But in this model, primary storage, right? So um, MinIO also offers a complete set of enterprise features, including catalog, firewall, KMS, cache, observability, console, which is a way to look at multiple deployments of MinIO all under one single pane of glass. And all of these specialized enterprise production ready features were designed with the S3 API and were designed for massively scaled MinIO deployments. So we built them for existing customers with exabyte data under management. So you have peace of mind that these features will be able to work for you as your data grows. Uh, and while the developers of MinIO they aren't obsessed with speed, they are obsessed with simplicity, largely because it's simplicity that allows for scale. The very lean, less than 100 megabyte binary, which means that MinIO can be installed anywhere uh, on a ground sensor detecting movement, uh, on a camera, on a wing of an aircraft, in a sensor, on an offshore oil rig, on your laptop, in a data center, in the public clouds, anywhere you have your data and you need to store it, MinIO can go there because of this super concentrated efforts have a very lean, scalable, simple infrastructure or software defined approach to to storage. I'll pass it back to so Alex can talk about his favorite subject. Yay! Open table formats, Apache Iceberg. Okay, you can tell that I'm, I'm excited about this topic. I mean, um, because I'm so so excited, I'm writing a book about it. But what what is this at the end of the day? Like people, keep, you've been hearing a lot, of, probably a lot about table formats and Apache Iceberg and Delta Lake and Hoodie. What is the hype? Well, the idea is to be able to take data that isn't in a database or a data warehouse, data that is sitting in parquet files. And again, parquet files are data files that are highly optimized uh, for, with, for compression, for performance, for storing data. But, at some, but oftentimes your data sets are too big for one single parquet file. So they are oftentimes across maybe dozens, hundreds, thousands of parquet files. But these parquet files aren't aware of each other. So these table formats, what they do is they create a metadata layer of metadata that allows them to sort of systems like Dremio and other compute systems to be able to take a look at those tables and not see them as like a thousand parquet files, but to see them as a singular data warehouse database like table with all the same guarantees, the same features, and be able to operate them, operate on them in the same way with the same kind of performance. Okay, which means you don't have to move your data. You can keep your data right there on your data lake and be able to have all the different tools that you use work with a single copy of your data, which is really nice when you're dealing with large petabyte, exabyte size data sets, which you don't want to be copying over multiple times the different systems. Um, now, the Apache Iceberg project itself, again, just sets the standard for how you write the metadata and creates libraries to help tools adopt the standard in languages like Java, Python, Rust, and Go. But basically, once you adopt the standard, you're able to operate on these tables. So tools like Dremio and others can operate on these tables with asset guarantees, meaning you're going to get consistent access to the data, atomic 
transaction, so you know partially halfway done transactions that either happens or it doesn't. Different transactions that are happening get to be isolated. That's the I. And then D for durability, that data is being stored in those parquet files on your MinIO storage. Okay. And this allows you to kind of get that data warehouse like paradigm directly from your data lake. And basically, with all sorts of features that optimize for speed, like partitioning, but Iceberg goes a step further where it tries to bring you things like partitioning, but in a form that makes it easier for data engineers to implement that partitioning and data analysts to take advantage of that partitioning, particularly with a feature called hidden partitioning. But it also enables your data engineers to do more experimentation uh, by using something called partition evolution, which is a unique feature to Iceberg. So that way, if you want to partition one way today, and you want to partition another way tomorrow, you don't have to rewrite your entire table to make that change. So basically, Iceberg allows your data on your data lake to become data warehouse like tables. And now all you need is a tool that allows you to run transactions against those tables. And that is where Dremio comes in. Dremio is a lakehouse platform, which at its core has a really powerful, really fast query engine. And the cool thing about the query engine is that it can operate on data anywhere. So you can connect things like databases, like a Postgres database you might have, or um, a data warehouse, like if you have a Snowflake or Redshift. But, you, but primarily, you can connect your data lake to Dremio, so like your MinIO data lake. Um, and if you have multiple MinIO data lakes, one deployed in the cloud, another deployed on-prem, you can connect both of them to Dremio and actually have your on-prem and cloud data all working together uh, from one window pane to run queries against. Okay, and when that data is stored as Apache Iceberg, you're going to get even additional benefits um, with the ability to read and write, along with the ability to manage those tables when you're using Dremio with Iceberg tables on your data lake, especially when you're cataloging those tables using Dremio's integrated enterprise Iceberg catalog that will track your Iceberg tables, it'll clean up your Iceberg tables, it'll optimize your Iceberg tables, but it also allows you to experiment on those tables through what's called catalog versioning. So that way you can create like a branch environment where you can make changes to those tables that don't affect what other people are seeing. Um, and there's a lot of really cool possibilities with that. But also Dremio allows you to govern the data sets that Dremio tracks. So you connect a data set to Dremio and again, across all these different data sources, you can curate views, cure, model your data that you need, make it accessible to your end users and govern it all in one place, have all your users access all the data in all in one place, making it much easier for that end user to find the data they need and be able to query, query it performantly. So that's what Dremio brings to the table. So basically, once you bring this all together, you have a place to store your data. You have a way to turn those, that, that, those data files that are being stored into data warehouse-like tables. And you have a tool that one gives you a data warehouse-like experience if it's web ui along with many other features to interact and basically make interacting with that, that data feel like a traditional data warehouse without all the extra costs and data movement that is required in a sort of one unified system uh, kind of like a, a wrapper uh, that kind of ties everything together but with that now that you know what the pieces are of the data lake, let's take a look at the benefits. Specifically, let's take a look at how other people who are already implementing these patterns are benefiting uh, from, well, the modern data lake. And when we take a look at customers who've implemented many of these pieces, you see these types of benefits. So for example, TransUnion, uh, from implementing this, they've noticed a 10 times performance gain from using Dremio Compute. So that means basically their queries are running faster. Now, faster running queries aren't just about fast. Okay, they're also about cost. The sooner queries are done, the, the less infrastructure you need. Okay, and the less likeliness that you have so many queries running that you do need to provision additional infrastructure. So you save money. Uh, two, also you get better insights. So when we're talking about like BI dashboards, last thing you want is that you turn a knob to adjust the dashboard and then you have to wait five minutes for that dashboard to refresh or longer. Okay. So generally you see, and for example, with NCR, you see a 30 times faster performance on their dashboards adopting this platform. Again, going from like minutes of having to wait for every refresh of that dashboard going to sub-second performance. Um, and that's again, you can always improve the performance by doing things like extracts and creating like materialized views and creating all sorts of different sort of copies that you then have to manage and keep consistent. But the beauty with Dremio and MinIO in this particular modern data lakehouse pattern, okay, you can do that and get that sub-second performance 
directly querying that data directly from the data lake. Okay, no need to have to add all these additional layers of complexity to get that performance. Um, now, another leading financial group saw a 60 plus percent cost to performance gain with MinIO over HDFS. So they were saving money tremendously over their legacy Hadoop, uh, Hadoop HDFS uh, system. And another financial company just, and again, this is even before really like changing what hardware they have. So they just took the existing hardware that they were running HDFS on, just installed Minio on it and saw immediately a 20% gain in performance. Okay, so basically getting value the minute they switched over. And as you can see here, again, the value you get when you're adopting Minio, Dremio, uh, is not something that you have to wait to get. It's immediate value from the moment you start, uh, from the performance, from the, the, the cost savings that you get from that, and that, that only grows as you adopt it for more and more workloads from, and store more and more of your data in these places. And we'll leave it off with one last quote from another global financial company. Using MinIO and Dremio has allowed us to go from a pretty much defunct technology, Hadoop, to a forward-looking one that, importantly, actually supports a true hybrid on-prem and cloud architecture. And that's a key thing. Again, both of the, all of these tools operate on-prem and in the cloud and both. So allowing you to have that flexibility, that optionality with all these other benefits that we have mentioned. But with that, I'm gonna bring Brenda back to kind of talk through how you can use this infrastructure as a foundation for AI ML. Great. Uh, so this is just one uh, type of architecture for AI and ML. And when we look back to that original slide at the beginning of the of this presentation, when we're talking about the initial challenges that our customers are facing, we saw flexibility, scalability, performance for AI and ML, optionality and flexibility that come with being able to deploy anywhere, uh, and of course, these aging infrastructure. So, so this is the replacement for these aging infrastructures, and this is optimization for AI. So in this architecture, we are using Hugging Face as the place where we retrieve data sets and models. And, that, and the heart of this will always be the modern data lake or the data lake house, where we have the storage layer, MinIL object storage, um, with the open table formats being contained within, and the query engine of the compute, in this case, Dremio, sitting on top of that object storage, querying the data within it. That is the heart of the whole thing. And there's a feedback loop between uh, the models and, of course, the ML ops pipeline, which is actually where the work of the AI ML pipeline happens. So this is where you're testing your models, you're creating them in the first place, you're doing feature selection, you're processing data, and then uh, saving those models and retrieving them, of course, from the vector database part of the AI ML uh, architecture. And so this is also um, on top of object storage. Your vector database could be your Pinecone DB, you know, your Lance DB. These are uh, very uh, fast vector searches that are really great at finding like uh, nearest neighbor searches and are ideal for storing and retrieving um, AI and ML workloads. They work together within this architecture because every instance of MinIO can talk to the other. So if you've got your vector database storage in on GCP and you've got your data warehouse on-prem, you can share data between the two of them as long as you've got you know the network support for that uh, very easily. And so this interconnectivity, this design was built up on purpose so that you can easily share, retrieve, and uh, query data as quickly as AI and ML workloads require it. And I'll hand it back now to Alex. And speaking about like the benefits like AI ML, it's like just talk, we'll run through like the process that one goes through when deploying an AI ML model and how these tools can really kind of help you in that process. So generally you start off by collecting a bunch of data, right? You have to go 
find the data, you have to kind of aggregate the data. And this can be really torturous when your data is strewn across several different data systems, databases, data warehouse, data lakes, data sharing platforms. Um, because oftentimes you might go get data from, let's say, like the Snowflake data market marketplace or the AWS marketplace, and then you have to copy that data over to another location. And so that way you can finally unify it. This is one of the places where Dremio can make life a lot easier because Dremio can connect to your MinIO data lake. So that way you can then also enrich that data with the data from these different marketplaces while you create the data sets that you want to use to train your AI ML models. Also, Dremio has a built-in um, wiki and tagging system. So that way you can help curate your data in the sense of creating context and um, documentation for that data to make it easier to help go wrangle that data and understand which data sets come from where and where they come from and so forth. So basically Dremio makes data wrangling really easy because it can bring all that data together in one place, which then allows you to kind of build your models and train your models by pulling that data from Dremio on the structured side. And then any unstructured data uh, that you have to train those models can even be pulled directly from MinIO in order to feed uh, that model training for when you later deploy the model and you're good to go. Um, Again, just kind of reiterating, that means you have seamless access to your data. You have the wikis to help create that context. Dremio allows you to virtually model that data so you can model that data without having to make copies. You have that whole Git for data thing I mentioned earlier where you have catalog versioning. So you can create different environments to create different versions of the data to see if that, to create experiments with your AI ML models to see if you can get different, better performance out of different versions of your data without necessarily having to manipulate the original data. And Last set, um, you can use that. You can also tag the data and tag those changes in the data so that way you can tag certain like points in time that you may want to use for reproducible tests. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and really helping you in those sort of typical AI ML or ML ops types of tasks. And when you take a look at this all together, you have that AI ML flexibility, you have all the components of a lake house, but you also have deployment flexibility and control. Whether it's MinIO, which can can be deployed anywhere. Again, as mentioned, it could be deployed on like a ship somewhere. It can be deployed anywhere. Same thing with Dremio. It can be deployed anywhere. This is all software based. So that means it can be deployed in your on-prem situations, which can be really great for like training AI ML models so that we can keep everything physically very close to each other to get that best performance when training. But you can also make sure that the data you need is in the cloud. So that way it can be located in physical regions that are closer to people who are running analytics on that data. You have all this flexibility to kind of create, put these pieces and deploy these pieces wherever you need to. So that way you get the performance that you need. Um, and these things talk to each other. And again, Dremio then also helps connect the other long tail of strands of your data world that you might have in other systems like databases and data warehouses. Because again, Dremio can connect all these things and then become that central access point between all these different layers. Because again, Dremio can act as a single place where you connect all your data. Everyone sees all the data from one single point pane, window pane and you can curate that data or model that data on a semantic layer. You have an enterprise catalog to help track and manage those iceberg tables. You have a query engine that allows you to federate queries across all these different data sources. And there's a cool feature called reflections that work kind of like materialized views with a lot of extra bells and whistles. But basically it's an acceleration technology that makes, makes it ability, it gives you the ability to accelerate performance on really big data sets uh, that might need it at a fraction of the cost and with a fraction of the work, because essentially Dremio will kind of abstract away and manage all the maintenance and consistency concerns that would normally kind of be an issue with materialized views. It just takes all that off the table. You just turn it on. Tab the table is just faster. Your analysts don't have to even be aware that anything has changed. They just query the tables they've always been querying and they just notice things are just suddenly faster. Okay, so basically Dremio really gives you a lot of ways to kind of break through those bottlenecks. Um, and then again, when you pair that with MinIO, you have that flexibility to deploy both of these platforms wherever you are, giving you that really, really robust flexibility. And with that, I'll bring Brenna back to tell us about how we can scale intelligently. Great. So scaling intelligently is really about applying and adding scale exactly where it's needed. There are a number of features in both MinIO and Dremio that make this two-headed approach possible, and we've broken it down into three categories. So the first is something we've really hammered home throughout this whole presentation, which is this hybrid multi-cloud 
approach that's possible with MinIO and Dremio that can both be deployed anywhere you need them to go. By this approach, you avoid things like vendor lock-in. If vendor A, let's say Azure, gives you credits, you can move your workloads there um, and not be locked into AWS or to GCP. Um, you can move where you need to or where your workloads require. And, um, and the great thing about Dremio and both MinIO is that you can connect um, data to wherever it is. So that's that column. Now, we, when we talk about scaling where you need it, this, this pinpoint accuracy, we're talking about the disaggregated storage of compute, which I, I started to talk about in a previous slide. But essentially, this means that MinIO and Dremio are completely separate. <laughs> different companies, different layers in the storage um, uh, in, in the uh, modern data lake. So when we talk, we look back into that slide about the three layers of modern data lake, MinIO and Dremio are completely separate, right? And so I'm hammering this home because very uh, often traditional ways of looking at storing and retrieving data were tightly coupled. So you have storage and compute all in one spot, which means that if you wanted to scale up one, you had to scale up the other. But with this disaggregated approach, you can scale up Dremio as required, and you can scale up MinIO as required and target which um, which ends of your data lake you need to. So for MinIO, this can look like adding more server pools, and it can be very easily done, more racks uh, to your, your infrastructure. And for Dremio, there's a lot of really cool auto-scaling features that can help you when you have a really heavy query running that will automatically speed up that query and give you that increased speed boost that you need. So you can add your dollars where they most uh, would be most impactful for your business. We're talking about minimizing costs. We're talking about migrating from legacy infrastructures. So after talking to our customers and also managing our own uh, infrastructures, MinIO infrastructures, we found that between one and three FTEs are needed for exabyte scaled MinIO infrastructures. So we're talking about massive scale with very minimal management and maintenance. You'll get more with less. And erasure coding it is one of the ways that MinIO maintains such a high degree of data reliability. It's basically a method that breaks up your data, creates redundancies, and then distributes that data across multiple nodes. It's for, for fault tolerance and for data recovery. And it's a really modern and efficient data protection strategy. And with erasure coding, you avoid extra hardware like you would need for Hadoop like RAID controllers. And as a result, less infrastructure is needed overall. So in many cases, we've seen customers reduce their drive space by a third. This is incredibly impactful. So you can't mention fault tolerance without saying something about active, active multi-site replication, which doesn't rely on creating multiple copies of the same data in the traditional sense that, for example, Hadoop requires for disaster recovery. Instead, active, active multi-site replication maintains a single copy consistent across multiple clusters. And so you're moving from one to three while still maintaining really high availability and fault tolerance. And you're gonna see an immediate cost savings in terms of the volume of data under management when you switch from HDFS to MinIO. So we're talking about the volume of data going down and also the necessary hardware to run this infrastructure going down uh, with this transition. So you save on multiple fronts. There's additionally some really cool features within Dremio that offer scaling intelligently, including reflections, which Alex pointed out a little bit before, but it's a way to automatically refresh and create materialized views, which can help with query speed. So if you're hitting this subject of scale from all different angles, which each aspect of the a modern data lake, uh, 
each layer of the modern data lake with, with the approach of using Minio and Dremio together. And with that, I'll pass it back off to Alex. And let's start bringing this home. But as we near the end of this presentation, um, again, if you have any questions, do hit the Q&A box there at the bottom and we'll answer those questions just as this presentation wraps up. So just so that way you can start writing in your questions. But with that, let's talk about a little bit about just putting this into play. Um, at the end of the day, like change can be ch change can be hard. Um, but luckily, Dremio can make change much easier because Dremio acts as that central window plane across all your different uh, data systems. It can also make it much easier to transition between data systems because Dremio does also work with Hadoop. So if you are using that sort of legacy Hadoop infrastructure, you could start, the first step is to actually just adopt Dremio and connect it to your Hadoop and get your, your consumers, your users ready, already using uh, the data straight from Dremio. Uh, one, you're gonna notice this, the performance benefits right away just because Dremio is handling the queries. But two, as your users get used to you working with Dremio, you can then connect the new MinIO system to Dremio. And then basically as users use the data, their lives do not change as you move data from point A to point B, because whether they're accessing the data from the legacy system or they're accessing data from the new system, it's going to be all through Dremio. So basically you minimize the change management, you minimize the friction from point A to point B. Um, and that's one of the uh, big benefits that Dremio can have when it comes to any kind of sort of migration between data systems by using it as a, a that universal sort of interface. You change, you don't, you make sure that people's workflows don't change as you change systems. Now, if you want to see a guide on how you can do this, this QR code that we have here at the bottom right will take you to where you can read a guide about making that transition uh, from legacy systems to sort of more modern systems. So I invite you all to scan that QR code and give that a read. But as we wrap up, let's just kind of summarize what we've been talking about. We've been talking about the modern data lake, kind of getting all these benefits uh, of being able to have that flexibility, having to reduce costs, having the easier maintenance, having robust governance, the ability to do better AI ML, all using this sort of new infrastructure that's made up of these three components of a storage layer like MinIO, of a table format like Apache Iceberg, and a compute layer like Dremio. And this allows you to move from legacy architecture with that leg so that we don't have the, all the bottlenecks that used to be there before. And now once you lift those bottlenecks, you really unlock a really solid foundation for AI and ML workloads for the types of projects that are becoming more and more of our sort of data of part of our data strategies uh, in today's time. But with that, you also get the flexibility and scalability of on-prem and cloud, okay? So both, whether the data is on-prem or the data is in the cloud, they both have their own relative sort of performance, flexibility, and scalability stories. And in today's world, you oftentimes need to take advantage of both of these stories. And the beauty of having platforms that can work in both environments really gives you that flexibility, that optionality, that, that ability to just kind of make the system that you need and the system that you want without having to sacrifice anything. Um, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, so, so you, again, you do that by taking the pieces that we talked about, MinIO as your object storage, as your data lake, Apache Iceberg as your table format, organizing all that those structured data sets on your data lake in Apache Iceberg, and then being able to manage all that and access all that and query all that using the Dremio Lakehouse platform. But with that, I'm going to open up the questions and um, yeah, we'll go check out the Q&A box. You can see more information about sort of how to keep in touch and keep tabs on Dremio and Minio. Make sure to follow both companies on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Thank you all very much. Have a great day and we'll see you on the question Q&A. Hello, everybody. Okay, it's time for Q&A. And basically, again, you can put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those as well. But for the first question uh, that I see, I see it's uh, for uh, Brenna and like, it's just walk through sort of like all the different places, um, like as far as like deploying Minio, like where are some of the more interesting places that you've seen Dremio deployed? I mean, not Dremio deployed, Minio deployed. <laughs> uh, so, it's interesting that you mentioned Dremio because um, uh, Minio and Dremio can both be deployed anywhere, almost anywhere. So um, the benefits or the reason why this is possible is that 
I mean, IO has a super small binary. It's less than 100 megabytes, um, and it runs on any commercial hardware. Um, we recommend um, uh, NVMe, uh, but that that those are hard drives that you can get off the shelf almost anywhere. And so because of this ability to run um, on any hardware, on any cloud, um, private, public, um, and because of the super small binary, it can go anywhere. I mean, I mentioned a few cool things that some people are doing, our custom, some of our customers or things we've heard about, which include uh, sensors on oil rigs, but um, the reality is it can go, you know, it can go anywhere you need it to because of this, um, this very like uh, a design centered approach to, to MinIO and, and, and to Dremio because um, th these, uh, the architectures are both are compatible in terms of where you can deploy them, which is just, you know, almost anywhere you can think of. I, I agree. Like if, if, if anyone hasn't done any of my Dremio tutorials, you've probably noticed in some of Brenda's as well, you, you've noticed that you'll, you'll deploy Dremio and Minio literally on your laptop and actually get hands on with these technologies. And if you haven't done those tutorials, I recommend heading over to the Minio blog, to the Dremio blog and looking up those tutorials and, and actually seeing what is, how easy it is to actually get Minio and Dremio running up just literally on your laptop and actually doing data analytics directly from your laptop. Um, just as, a, a proof of concept to, to show you what it is in action. Um, but with that, I see another question. Okay, so this one is a little bit more about sort of like um, Apache Iceberg versus sort of like alternative formats, sort of like uh, what what makes Iceberg sort of different in the alternative. So for those who are unfamiliar, there's generally three main formats. There's four now. So basically the main three originally were Apache Iceberg, Delta Lake and Apache Hoodie. And then more recently, you have a new entrant in Apache Paimon, which came out of the Flink project. Um, but all all of them offer you some basic sort of fundamentals because they're all fundamentally trying to make it where you have tables on your data lake where you can basically treat a group of parquet files and treat them as sort of one singular unit. So all of them are going to give you asset transactions, schema evolution. But where things really differ is oftentimes in the data management, meaning sort of like how those parquet files are written and how the metadata is tracked. Because when you're using a parquet, when you're using an iceberg writer to write those parquet files, it, it does do, it is going to write it based on sort of the, 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 the setup of the table, like how is the table partitioned and whatnot. And this is where icebergs, very unique partitioning features really can provide a lot of value. Um, because one, uh, with the iceberg, you have a feature called hidden partitioning, which means your partition doesn't have to be explicitly physical, meaning if I have a timestamp column and I want to partition based on the month, I don't have to physically make another month column that's physically existing in all my parquet files. That's something I can express in my metadata, and then my me my metadata will track those transform values. It'll be like, okay, even though there's only a timestamp column, here's the, the extracted or transformed month value in the metadata for, for helping plan scan, uh, scans much more efficiently. This also makes it easier for the analyst. So it makes smaller data files, makes it easier for your engineer because basically they can specify that transform at the creation of the table and they don't have to necessarily change their data pipelines to do all this extra work of making this other field and doing this transformation of the data at that point and transforming literally every record versus doing a transformation of ranges of values, which is gonna be much more lightweight um, versus, and then also make it easier for the data analyst because they don't have to add these extra query predicates. So Iceberg has a very fundamental different way that it does partitioning that makes it easier to take advantage of partitioning, but also and then this partition evolution, which allows you to ch change your partitioning. So when it comes to managing that data for performance, Iceberg very uniquely gives you a level of flexibility that other formats don't, uh, which is one of the reasons why Iceberg, that in its openness has really kind of given it the groundswell of support that it has. Um, because there's ways to use the format, all the formats together or use multiple formats with things like uniform and Apache X table, but really the format that you choose to write your data, like the actual writers you use to write those parquet files, will make a big difference in sort of like what those par how those parquet files are structured, which can affect uh, performance and flexibility down the road. Which is why, to me, I generally default to Iceberg as the format that I write to. Um, I also think it's going to be awesome on the read side, but then like you know those other tools will enable any need I have for the other formats. But I think Iceberg provides the best sort of story for partitioning uh, on the right side. And you lose that if that's not your home-based format. Okay, I think I saw another question pop up. Um, I think 
or I guess it might have disappeared. Um, if someone had a question, or maybe they put their hand up, if they have a question, please write it in the Q&A box, so that way we can see the question, um, and then we can answer the question. So I'll give everyone a moment to well, whoever raised their hand to uh, write that question inside the Q&A box, which should be, oh, I think it's in there now. On what distributed file system the MinIO can be deployed on? Okay, that's a question for you, Brenna. I, uh, I, basically, I think the question is MinIO. MinIO is the distributed file system. But I guess the question is like sort of what maybe what hardware would you deploy uh, Min I, that's the MinIO software on to achieve that distributed file system? Yeah, it's great. So yeah, MinIO is the distributed uh, file system. So MinIO is your storage software. It's just storage software. Um, but we do one thing really, really well. The most performant, um, the, the fastest, the um, open source. So it's just the file system. Um, and uh, by uh, its nature, of course, it is distributed. And you can put it anywhere. Like I said, commercial hardware, we recommend NVMe. Um, uh, um, for the, when, when you purchase MinIO, we'll walk you through um, the um, your hardware. And we recommend getting brand new hardware for your architecture naturally um, because MinIO uh, fills the wire completely, completely. The only um, impediment to MinIO's performance is the hardware itself. Um, so when you're choosing your architecture, and that's something we work with you on, um, you have to think about, you know, your your SLAs, the, the needs of your business and how fast you want those those Dremio queries to operate, right? And retrieve the data from Minio, how how uh, fast you want them to write back into uh, Minio. And, and uh, part of that equation is the hardware that you choose. Now, that being said, and that's just for on-prem deployments, for, uh, you know, we've hammered this home in, in the session, but you can deploy Minio and Dremio in any of the public clouds and GCP, um, Azure, if, um, so like if that's your choice, you don't have to worry about the hardware limitations, but uh, this design on purpose gives you that flexibility and, and, and can go, you can put this distributed file source anywhere. And maybe, maybe the question is something like what kind of files Minio can support. And, um, if that's the case, then Minio can do both unstructured and structured. So, um, you know, CSV, parquets, um, images, songs, uh, iceberg, hoodie. Oh. Yeah. Um, you posted a follow up to give some more details on the question. So I think the, so basically they're saying like not so much can you deploy it on top of a machine that is a Linux OS, NAS, yes. uh, SAT, and DFS. Not yeah, of course. Um, like I said, we run on any commercial hardware. Um, um, we can. Um, it, uh, we have a Kubernetes native. It's containerized software, so it can go anywhere you need it to go. Um, most people deploy on um, Linux, like most like of our customers, um, but um, doesn't have to be like you know. I, like uh, like you said uh, for um, like Alex was saying, uh, you can deploy it on your laptop. Um, I have a Mac uh, because of its dock. Uh, containerized nature, I can and I can literally go anywhere you need to, to go. Yeah, and just to expand upon that, like one, I think it's like one, it can be installed on any like it works generally for any operating system. But again, it's going to be the operating system. Oftentimes, it's like kind of involved in whether it's like NAS, FAT, or NTFS. But uh, MinIO doesn't act as the oper operating system. It's on top. It's installed within whatever operating system you're using. So in that case, it'll work on whatever sort of fundamental yeah. sort of box storage you have in the physical machine. Yes, and as, as and as Brenna mentioned, you can deploy it anywhere. And you can. And the cool thing is you, you have flexibility in that. Like, for example, you can deploy a, a mini I.O. cluster and a Dremio cluster separately, and they talk to each other. You can actually deploy them on the same machines. I think we have a couple of customers that actually co-locate Dremio and min I.O. on the same machine. So every min I.O. node is a Dremio node. So that way they can access the data even faster um, uh, because you're not having to move stuff over the network. Um, so there's a lot of interesting ways you can do that depending on sort of what you need. And that's the beauty of these two pieces of of software that that level of flexibility and um, to build the system that you need um, wherever you need it. So yeah, um, I think that is all the questions for today. But with that, again, I want to say, Brenna, thank you so much for coming on the show. We look forward to having you again sometime. Um, and yeah. 
And then also, I will see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my you. favorite subject is as is data lakes and i'm always happy in data lake houses and i'm always happy to talk about them so um please it, you know we, we have resources on our blog and dremio's blog for getting started with Mayo and dremio or for uh, enhancement tweaks if you've already um you have them both deployed um and we'd always happy to um, help out with any hardware questions or um, like any specific hardware questions like this is my this is how many drives I have this is how many nodes I want this is how much data I have um, by dropping us a line at uh, hello at min.io or on our slack channel love to see you there and also Dremio has a, a really uh, great uh, lake house slack channel that's really hopping so if you have lake house questions or data lake house questions sorry um, there's a resource there for you too Yep. And then, and yeah, again, thank you. I'll see you all uh, on our next Mali Dayways. Again, uh, we're also doing for uh, other things we have going on right now. Are, we're still doing the Iceberg Crash Course. So you can go to the Mali Dayways page and sign up for that to join those sessions. And also, we have a lot of new content on the YouTube channel, uh, including sort of a new hands on demo. So if you want to walk through, but that actually uses Dremio and Minio, uh, and you walk through building a lake house on your laptop and trying out a lot of this uh, analytic functionality, which you can check out over there on the youtube.com slash Dremio. But otherwise, I'll see you all later. Have a great day and enjoy. In the world of data where the oceans run deep, you need a compass to guide you, a promise to keep. With a patchy arrow in hand, we're flying high. Processing queries under a wide open sky Welcome to the lake house where the rivers flow Federated queries make your data glow From iceberg to reflections, we're breaking the mold Let me